we're in a topical series, which means every week I've tried to pick a different passage of scripture, and I've sort of given you some other scriptures as we've gone along. The series I'm in is called the, the New, I Am a Christian. It's a new believer study. I am a Christian. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? So I am a Christian. Now what? And so many people come to Christ. Maybe you've been in the faith for some time, and you need sort of a reset. So let's kind of rethink through this. What does it mean to be a Christian? So week one, we talked about this is who we are, our identity in Christ. Week two, we moved into a discussion about this is um, what we do. You know, the Christianity is not a set of rules and actions that we do. We do out of identity. Uh, our, our work is, is sort of an outflow of who we are in Christ. But, but really, as we looked at some of those things last week, it can be sort of overwhelming. Like, how do I do that? And, and, and how many of us, even now I've been a Christian, I came to Christ in my childhood years, and I'm in my late 40s, and so there's a sense like, God, I feel like after all these years, I still miss, like, how am I supposed to do it? And, and there's seasons where I'll see great victory, and other seasons where it's, things are a little busier, and I deviate from it. And so tonight, I want to focus on, initially, I had four points, but I'll give you a fifth, a freebie. So we're going to make our way through them. I thought we would use as our text, Galatians chapter 5, and just let me read you verse 16 through the end of the chapter. It's just a jumping point. I'm not going to you know, break it down in any expository fashion, but just to give you a taste of what we're going to talk about tonight, which is um, this is how we do it, uh, lesson three of this series. And so here we go, Galatians 5 verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Honestly, I could stop right there, and this could be our bouncing first. I mean, this could be it. Because this is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Now, and this really summarizes how we are to do it. But we're going to keep going. And so verse 17 says, for the desire, he goes on to explain. Paul does a great job of explaining his points. So he says, walk by the Spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And who, isn't, who can't say amen to that? And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. Uh, yep, I feel it. And to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity. You might be like, man, that's a heavy list. Well, look at this. Strife, jealousy, fits of angers, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Does that sound familiar to how we've watched our culture and specifically the Christian cultures in the, in the last few weeks? Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Just a heavy passage of Scripture where Paul sort of says, he sort of defines what he's already talked about in other letters. In Romans chapter 7, he talks about this tension, where as a Christian, you, you want to do certain things, but you find yourself unable to, and so you're constantly struggling. And, and he boils it down even in Romans chapter 8, where he kind of reminds you that, that you have a choice. You're either going to live by the flesh and die, or by the Spirit and live, and and. and and talking about spiritual death, why do so many Christians feel sort of dissuaded? Man, I just don't feel alive in Christ. And perhaps the problem is that you're not living in the Spirit. And so when we think about this is how we do it, the first point is this. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do a thing. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do a thing. The Christian life is impossible without the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it. It is too hard. You even look at this list. You go, well, I haven't done any orgies this week. But how many of us haven't had a fit of anger? How many of us haven't looked at somebody with envy? How many of us haven't had, you go on down the list. I mean, some of the strife, divisions, dissensions, those seem to be like respectable sins. We might be like, okay, I'm crossing off the big bad ones. But you look at the other things, you mean, I can't do this. How does God expect me to do it? Let alone the rest of the stuff that comes along with the Christian life. And the answer is you cannot do it without the Holy Spirit of God. And you say, well, how do I get the Holy Spirit of God? Just a little review, I think last semester we kind of hit some of these points, but this is a new series, so if you're joining afresh, remember that the, the minute you give your life to Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, is worth you uh, kind of marking down, but, but the minute you give your life to Jesus, the whole you become part of the family of God, part of Christ, and the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you. He says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So the minute you 
you give your life to Jesus, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes over. We talked last week and the week before about how we're now dead to sin. We're alive to Christ. And so the Spirit of God comes and dwells in us. Jesus, in John chapter 14, all the way through about 16, talks a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. If you're ever like, man, I just, I want to know more about the Holy Spirit. Just take like a month. And read through John 14, 15, and 16. Read through them over and over and over and over again. And you'll understand what the Holy Spirit is and who the Holy Spirit is based on what Jesus says. In fact, Jesus makes this discourse shortly before he gets crucified. And he uses these words. He says in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Later in verse 13, he says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Earlier, he uses other language where he says, um, Those things I have spoken to you in chapter 14, verse 26, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things. And so Jesus teaches a lot about the Holy Spirit. Remember that God is a trinity. He's a, that's unique of God, the God of the Bible, the, um, the, the, this Jehovah God that we worship is the only God who is three in one. There is no other God, but there's a lot of religions that claim that they have this God or that God, little g gods, but God Almighty is three in one. The Trinity is, is completely impossible to understand. Uh, there's a lot of good books about the Trinity. You can read about it, but God uh, in three in one was all the way back in Genesis 1-1. If you read through that, the Spirit of God hovered over all the earth, and, and you go on, and, and when he talks about making man, he says, God says about man, let us let us make man in our image, and, and he talks about himself in the plural because he is three in one, and so God the Father, and then there's God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit, it is, he is a person. It is not an it 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 is not a spirit he is a person and jesus says man i'm going to go away but the spirit of god is going to come and live in you and so the minute you give your life to jesus you're baptized by the holy spirit of god but then there is an infilling a filling of the holy spirit of god i i love what uh, has been said it is um, by some pastors it, uh, uh, this is a good quote or a good question it is not do i have the holy spirit but does the holy spirit have me and that is the essential question of how the Christian life is supposed to be lived. It's not whether a Christian has the Holy Spirit. That is not debatable. There's not a separate event of salvation where the Holy Spirit comes in you. No, the promise of God is you die at salvation to self. The Spirit of God comes and lives in you. But there's a daily infilling of the Holy Spirit, a moment-by-moment -moment infilling. Um, probably the best verse to, to summarize that would be in Ephesians, I believe, chapter 6 uh, or, or 5 or 6. Let me just turn there real quick. It's the verse where, where Paul talks about... about um, uh, do not be drunk with wine. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, I uh, believe it is, where he says, uh, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And in the same concept, this isn't a verse about alcohol. This is a verse about the Holy Spirit. And it is a verse that is using this analogy of just like when you drink wine, you no longer are in control of yourself. The wine sort of takes over. In the same fashion, the Spirit of God ought to control you. And so when we are looking like the, the passage that I started reading where he says, look, even as a Christian, there's the old flesh and the new spirit, and there's the tug of war going. And the entire process of what we call sanctification, which is our becoming more like Jesus, that's what sanctification is, that takes the entire Christian life until we see Jesus, that entire process is a daily saying, recognizing I am dead to self, I'm alive to the spirit. And that is hard to do. In fact, I'd say it's impossible without the Holy Spirit. And yet, anytime you feel insufficient, anytime you feel like I can't do it, the answer is God has given you his Holy Spirit so that you can do it in his strength. And so Jesus himself had taught us these things. You say, well, okay, practically, what does that look like? Okay, without the Holy Spirit, we can't do a thing. Well, you see a little bit of this in, in, in Galatians chapter five. He says, I say, walk by the Spirit. So there's an intentionality. There's a yieldedness. He says, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Romans eight, by the way, is a great other passage of scripture where you can spend a few minutes 
uh, later today and read through sort of this tug of war of how you can choose to live one way or the other because God did not create us as robots. So we have to decide where are we going to, to who are we going to yield to, the old flesh or the new spirit? But he says this in Romans 8. I think this will encourage you before we move to the next point. He says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, listen more. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption uh, by uh, of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is powerful. He says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, you've received Jesus. You, that moment you had an experience with the Lord where you saw yourself as a sinner, where you understood the payment of Christ on the cross for your sin, where you wanted that. You saw that you couldn't save yourself just like you can't save yourself. In the same way, you cannot change yourself. You cannot sanctify yourself, but you can yield to the Holy Spirit. And so there's a level of this. If I were to summarize sort of how does that practically play? play? Number one, you've got to... This is a sub point, by the way, to number one. So, so, so how do you walk by the Spirit? First of all, there has to be an element of receiving it by faith. So you read these verses, you, God tells you how it is. You can either fight it and say, well, I've got to work in my life, or you can receive it by faith, just like you did salvation. At some point, you can say, okay, God, I'm going to believe that this is how you do it. Do I understand the intricacies of it? Not really, but more or less, I, I'm going to believe it for now. And so there's this, this believe it. There's a reception by faith. There, secondly, there's a yielding to God. There is a, that going back to that question, it's not how much I have of the Holy Spirit. The answer is 100%. But really the question is how much does the Holy Spirit have of me? And so in that, there's a yielding to him. And that yielding presents itself or shows itself via confession of sin regularly not for salvation, you're already forgiven at salvation of all your sin that you've ever done, but, but daily we are not perfect. God knows that we're not perfect and we're a growth, we're supposed to be growing day by day. We look at men and women in scripture, none of them were perfect. I mean, you look at Peter as a great example of a person who constantly, you know, not constantly, but a lot missed the boat and yet eventually learned and grew and eventually wrote the book of First Peter and, and the stuff that comes out of his life is incredible how by the Holy Spirit, and of course at Pentecost, just a huge turnaround in the life of Peter, but even after Pentecost. Remember in the New Testament, there's an argument that happens between Peter and, and Paul, and sort of there's a big doctrinal thing. I mean, he wasn't perfect. My point is every man and woman in the scripture is not perfect, except for Jesus. And that's why we need Jesus. And so, and, so, and so yield to him. There's a daily confession. A good verse for you is 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful. And this 1 John is written to believers. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so you yield to God. You say, okay, God, I recognize every morning. Why do you spend time with God? Because there's a connection that happens. And you re, re, look at your life and you say, how am I doing? How am I doing spiritually? How am I doing physically? How am I doing emotionally? And you recognize the sin. You read a list like last week we talked about putting off and putting on. This week we were looking at Galatians. You, go, you know, Lord, if, if you want to know, by the way, an easy way to tell if you're walking by the Spirit or walking by the flesh is to look at the, the list that we just read in Galatians chapter 5. How, what, what is the fruit of your life? The way to know what is going on in a tree is to look at the fruit. If there's mulberries on a tree, I used to have a mulberry tree in my old apartment in Milwaukee when I was in medical school, and this thing was flourishing with mulberries. If you see mulberries on a tree, then it's a mulberry tree. And, and, and so when we read about the fruit of the Spirit, which is fruit that only the Holy Spirit can do with us, you don't, you don't, you know, there's this concept, I think sometimes we, we read the fruit of the Spirit and we go, well, I'm going to work on being joyful today. And so you make your little gratitude list and you go outside and you go, I am joyful today, but you're not. And you're like, I am joyful today. And you get so mad at yourself because you're like, I'm not joyful. And, 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 and the fruit of the Spirit isn't something we do. It is something the Holy Spirit does in us. And so joy sort of, you, as, as you yield to God, as you confess your sins, as you see areas in your life. Last week I mentioned, I'm trying to grow in gentleness. Well, how can I be gentle? Oh, here's my water bottle. I'm going to really be gentle. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Oh, come give me a hug. This is gentleness. We have, first of all, that's not what gentleness is, right? It's not giving hugs. It is a work of the Holy Spirit in us that, that is full of compassion and meekness and Christ-likeness. And, and you can't make yourself be it. God in his spirit works it in you. 
How? As you believe that he is in you, as you give yourself, yield yourself to him, and as you refuse, thirdly, as you refuse to quench the spirit of God in you, and you refuse to quench him by, by confessing sin, by, by keeping close accounts with the Lord, by hating him, by showing up to spaces like this, by going, I hate Zoom, I just, yeah, but by intentionally showing up when there's no church meeting in a house because you know that you need it. So, so you don't quench the spirit. Instead, you put yourself in a place where you can hear the word of God in your life. Well, how do you do these things? If that sounds like so much work, correct. You do it by relying on the Holy Spirit. There's a daily yielding of saying, okay, I need this. I don't know how to do it, but God, you know. You know me, you know my desires, you know who I am. I want victory over those areas of sin, over those areas of, of, of whatever it was in, in Galatians 5 that you're focusing on. Say, God, I can't do this on my own. I yield myself to you. So anything, anything, and everything in the Christian life cannot be done in the flesh. The Spirit of God has to do it in you. All you need to do, the only thing we're asked to do is to say yes. You say yes, God. You give yourself to him. So, so without Holy Spirit, we cannot do a thing. Here's the second thing. Without other Christians, we cannot grow to full capacity. I know that's hard to stomach in a very individualistic, independent culture where, you know, especially now, we don't even need to go to work. We can do it out of the house. Like there's such a push now to build the world out of our own home. Like people want to just, you know, break down office buildings because you don't need them anymore. Big warehouses are shutting because they're not needed anymore. We can do everything in our house. And, and like everybody's living in this little bubble and, and everybody's back pain is through the roof. I get more calls about back pain and issues related to working at home and carpal tunnel and you name it. And, but, 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 but we've sort of built this bubble where we almost resent the notion that we need each other and we want to prove it wrong like I, I got it it's me and the Holy Spirit we're a good team and yet do you know that 59 commands in the New Testament are called the one another commands we last week we talked about the importance of going being a part of a local body of um, there's if Hebrews 10 comes to mind where he says don't forsake the assembling of the saints you think about the communal breaking of bread and sharing of blood Christians uh, every so often in your church you might practice this Eucharist where you think about the body of Christ this is not meant to be an individual thing this is a community thing you look at the early church you look at but beyond that you just look at the commands of the Lord I mean he talked about they're going to know you by your love well you need people to love you look at the fruits of the spirit they're all have a horizontal effect. I mean, joy is internal, uh, but then you think about gentleness and and and, and self-control and, and goodness and kindness, and they're all horizontal. But then besides that, those 59 commands where we're told, hey man, this is a command from God to, to one another. And so there's be at peace with one another. You make your way out, print it. And there's two pages worth. I'm not going to read them all, but love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, stop passing judgment on one another, accept one another, instruct one another, greet one another with a holy kiss. Every single person, every single meaning non-married person is like, yes, no, I'm just teasing. But, 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 but there's, it goes on and on. Wait for each other when you come together to eat. Have equal concern for each other. Serve one another in love. It is incredible. The whole Christian faith is about community. It's about, this is how we keep growing. It's about learning how to relate in love to one another. Think about it. Why did God come to, there's an incarnational richness and aspect of the Christian life that is unique to Christianity. Jesus was born as a human. He lived with us. He ate with the disciples. He made meals for them. He, he hung out with them. They walked together. They, they, they went to each other's homes. They, they shared burdens together. They sang hymns together. You look at the community of early believers, and, and it was centered on these one another's. Because, because people are the space where love grows or where we see how our love for others is challenged. I think we're at a peak where loving others is hard. We can fake it, right? We go to church for an hour. This was used to be the model until COVID. You used to go to church for an hour. You could fake loving people who, you know, could touch you in an hour. Now you have to go to people's homes. You're going to be there two or three hours. And you're like, man, I don't even like people. But, but the one another's. Why do so many pastors and say, man, home church has been a gift, right? Why? Because now you actually have to learn to live with each other. And so without other Christians, you won't grow to your full capacity. I think about why in this season we're going to be doing the community groups. I love lecturing. I love going to meetings, standing up, lecturing, and leaving. But that's not how discipleship happens. That's motivational. That's inspirational. That might even excite you. There's a space for it. I'm not saying a lot, you know, I'm gifted in that. There's a space for that. But where the work happens is in that daily grind with other Christians, the sharing of burdens, 
the speaking truth into one another, the supporting one another, the, the helping one another. So we need more mature Christians in our life to disciple us. This is Titus chapter 2. We, we need regular meetings with other Christians to hold us accountable. We need to serve one another to keep on growing. And so those are things that I hope we'll be able to do in a very small way. I know we don't live in the same spaces, but even in our community groups, the idea is just we don't want to be, just be a face on the computer. Or, or in, you know, I, I, I'm the expert at this person who shows up to church late, sits in the back and leaves early, and I don't want to be uncomfortable. I'm a bit introverted, and I just don't do great at small talk. But that's not what the local church is. Are you willing to make the sacrifices that you'll need? A, to say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit, and B, to say no to, I want to live my way in the comfort of my home and to give yourself to other Christians in a way that you might not be comfortable doing, but that is biblical. And, and that is the secret to thriving as a Christian. You say, why am I not growing? Well, who's, who, who is in your life keeping you accountable? Who's speaking truth to you? Who's praying with you? Who's supporting you when you have a burden? Who are you supporting when they have a burden? The more you give of yourself, the more you receive. It's the biblical principle. And so those are two ways. We're going to move to the third. So we're talking about this is how we do it. The Holy Spirit, other Christians. Number three, without God's grace, we cannot stop sinning. So this whole discussion on, on the Holy Spirit and yielding to him sort of centered on sin. You say, you, and and so, the, so it's almost like the, the Holy Spirit is in us. He, he's at work in us. He's convicting us. But the reality is, I mean, who hasn't lived a day in, in, in our Christian walk? And like, we're like, man, I just, I couldn't go one day without sin. I'm telling you, I'm being truthful. Like there's bad thoughts that come into your mind. And I'm not meaning even, I'm just meaning like envy and anger and impatience and, and unkindness. And I don't like this. And yeah, he looks funny. And we all do it. We look through our, you know, we have ungodly ways and we, we're, we're not perfect. And it's so frustrating. I mean, that's, I'm not even talking about the big scandalous sins. I'm talking about the regular sins. They're not just. They're not just like, oh, human things. No, there's sin. If you're in line and, and you're impatient and the person ahead of you is going slow and you start huffing and puffing or you then verbalize and say, man, I can't believe you guys aren't going faster. It's murmuring and complaining. And, and it's sin. And we've excused it. That's why we need God's grace. We've, we're, we've gotten so good at quenching the spirit that most of us don't, don't notice when we're walking in a path of sin. We just, we just minimize it. So, so, so at the end of the day, if you stop and take, you know, sort of take stock of how the day's gone, yeah, okay, I mean, the Holy Spirit's in me, but man, I blew it today. And so in that setting, you need God's grace. You need God's grace to not sin to begin with, but you also need God's grace when you can't do it on your own. So you need the Spirit of God who you're yielded to say, okay, God, I can't do it. Spirit of God, you're going to have to bear this fruit. You're going to have to do the work. I, I don't do what you need to do. And so he prunes and he cuts and and you're going to have to go back to the table and say, Lord, I, I've deviated from it, and I'm sorry, and here I am again. I've blown it again, but now this grace. The best picture of grace is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in my mind. I love, I love, love those verses where Paul is struggling with the thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. It could be anything. You could plug in your besetting sin. You can plug in a handicap, whatever it is, but it causes him trouble and he asked God to remove it and and I think again about so many things in our Christian life like man I just wish I didn't like this thing or I just wish I didn't rely on that thing or I just wish I didn't always behave this way and we all have our thing where if truth be told man we don't want to be that way but we are and we're like God I want to change there I don't know how to change and God sometimes says what he says to sometimes he removes it but sometimes he says what he says to Paul he says my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. I think about so many brothers and sisters in Christ who are same-sex attracted. The last couple of weeks in my podcast, we've had episodes on same-sex attraction and sort of how that works. And, and it, that is one example of this, where th that attraction may not just magically fade. I think about people with addictions and, and, and whether it's alcohol or drugs and, and your desire, for whatever it is, like you just go down the list of things that in our culture are now things that we talk about all the time. And, 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 and you might be like, man, God, why don't you just make it go away? Why don't you just change that about me? And, 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 and sometimes the answer is because I'm strong enough for you're not enough. So what you're going to get today is grace. Every single person who's not married in this room understands that. We have our own issues that we deal with, and we're like, man, I may not be same sex attracted, but I sure have my own issues. So how do I do it, God? Why don't you just change me? Why don't you just 
you know, so I was listening to a sermon yesterday about Daniel, and I've always been sort of impressed with Daniel, and I'd forgotten that he had been, he's, he was a eunuch when he was taken prisoner to Persia, and I thought, and in my head, I thought, man, he had it easy, like the guy was castrated, basically. I'm like, well, my God, why don't you do something like that in our life to help us, you know, and on and on, like whatever, and, and God's like, because, because I give you grace, grace. And so the Holy Spirit convicts, changes us, but we still fail. God isn't expecting us to be perfect. He's already died for us. He's already forgiven all our sin. He's already paid the penalty for the penalty of our sin. But now he's teaching us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But in that journey, as we condemn ourselves, we're like, God, do you even like me? God, I'm always sinning. God, he reminds us there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, here's some more grace. In Romans 5, I believe he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Those are shocking words that should fill us with joy. If you have ever struggled with sin, man, you should just be like, oh. because sin abounds, and the longer you are in Christ, the more aware you are of sin, and the harder it is to wrestle with it, because you're like, man, I should know better, I should be, and, 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 and grace. God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he does want us to grow. And he gives us the tools to do it. God doesn't expect us to stop facing temptation. Temptation will come. This, we're living in a broken world. In fact, the Spirit of God led Jesus after, after the baptism of Jesus. The Spirit of God, well, God spoke over him. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew chapter 3, the very last verse. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, we're told that the Spirit of God led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And so God doesn't always remove the temptation, but he teaches us how to fight it. He reminds us that we've already been victorious in Christ over it. God doesn't expect us to be strong, but, but to find our strength in him. Here's a fourth. So we're talking about how to do all the Christian life. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do a thing. Without other Christians, we cannot grow to full capacity. Without God's grace, we cannot stop sinning. And number four, without communion with God, we cannot keep on going. I originally had this point as without God's word, we cannot keep on going. And while I believe, I mean, I told you guys, our ministry is about biblical truth for everyday life. I am a Bible person. I love God's word. I believe God's word. I stand on God's word. I want it to cover me. I want, I am that person. And yet I've learned the longer I am in Christ that it's not just about knowing God's word, but about communion with God in your heart. Now his word is the means that he gives us to connect with him. Prayer is the language he gives us to express our heart to him. Silence and solitude is the space where this happens, but there ha you cannot, you will not have a chance to make it in the Christian life if you do not learn communion with God. Early on in my teenage years, I remember my mom telling me about that, uh, it's, somebody mentioned that today in a podcast thing that I do with, with um, Pastor Ron Zappia and some of the other folks at High Point Church. It's such a great team of people that they've invited me to be a part of. By the way, you should follow that podcast if you don't. Irina, maybe you can put a link to it. We do these discussions. I'm part of a group of four, myself and three other guys, and we talk about each podcast that they do on uh, topics related to culture. It's been a really a lot of fun, but, but Ron mentioned that book, and I thought about how, the first time I heard about that book, and it's the story of Brother Lawrence and his writing about practicing the presence of God. See, too many of us have gotten caught up into just, I, and I have it, I'm not, I'm not bashing it. This is what I'm doing for my Bible reading plan this year. We've showed you guys what we're doing, and, and I'm, I'm slightly ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm in week five. I love crossing off, but, 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 but this isn't about crossing off boxes to say, man, I finished my reading. What, I'm, what we're going after is delight in the presence of our Savior. It is communing, communion with him so that whether, like Brother Lawrence, he's sweeping the kitchen floors or you're raising your hands in worship at an awesome Christian concert, the presence of God is there. You're aware of the presence of God. There's communion with God. And so the way that many Christians have done it and the way that the discipline grows is usually with a set time, a set place. You don't need a long time. You can be 10, 15 minutes a day. It literally, it takes 15 minutes to go through these readings that we've offered you as a, as a way to just help keep you accountable. Man, this, is a, this is how we spend time with God. You pray, you ask God to bless the time. And, and when my new book comes, we're offering with it a journal where we sort of help walk you through that. Take a minute and sit in silence before God, ask his presence to be with you in this place, become aware of him, slow down your breathing, the Lord needs, I need that, and then read the passage, and then meditate over it, and it might just be one, one 
verse and, and on and on. And then, and then those 10, 15 minutes, you might want to come back to that later in the day. God forbid that you spend a couple more minutes with the Lord before bedtime or at lunchtime. And so you learn to live your life, not like God up there and I'm here, but there's a communion with God. Enoch in the Old Testament walked with God and then he was not because God took him. Imagine, I thought about that today. I thought today people would be like, he went missing. But the Bible tells us that God took him. He's doing one of a couple of people in scripture that didn't die that were just taken up. Elijah was another example. He was taken up in a chariot. But Enoch, we don't know much about him except a couple of verses, but we know this, that he walked with God and then he was not. I think about Moses, you know, this week I had this aha moment in my quiet time. We call it quiet time, my communion time, whatever I'll call it. And it was in the evening a couple of nights ago and I was reading about Moses. I'm in Exodus, we're in Exodus in this. And I, and I, I, I thought about this in chapter three of Exodus in verse one. Moses had, the, you know, the story in chapter three, the burning bush, I mean, who hasn't watched the movie, right? And so, so God appears to Moses in a burning bush. But the background of the story is that for 40 years, 40, 40, Moses had been in the wilderness. He had been called by God. He felt he had a calling on his life early in his life. And he tried to, to take control of that calling. So he went and killed one of the Egyptians who was hurting one of the people of God. And and because of it, um, he had to escape Egypt. And so he escapes Egypt and everything that he thought God wanted him to do looked like it was down the drain. Have you ever had that? Where you had a dream for God, a calling from God, and you're like, it's gone, I don't even see it. So for 40 years, he's in this wilderness. He ends up meeting a family, he marries a woman, and he's like a shepherd. A, a young man who had been born, you know, put in Pharaoh's home and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and had everything given to him. And now he's 40 years in the wilderness. And I had this striking moment of, uh, you know, sort of this aha moment. I read chapter three, verse one, and it says, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And it says, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And you know, before the burning bush, we're told that Moses made his way to the mountain of God. I, I thought about that. I thought, you know, I wonder if Moses for 40 years, every day he would wake up and take his sheep and go out there and think about the mess that his life had become and sort of the drudgery and the boredom and sort of this feeling maybe of being stuck and of maybe the disappointment of, God, I thought you were gonna use me and now look, I'm just here with the sheep. And so how many times had he gone to the mountain of God, praying, hoping, communing, with communing with God, thinking, meditating, how, how, how much time and solitude was spent in those 40 years while Moses would walk to the mountain. It, was a, it sounds like a familiar place, like he would go there. And on that day, God shows up with a burning bush. And I thought, you know, we get so discouraged in the Christian life. We, I mean, I'm, I'm tired of showing up. I've, I've done my time. I used to read the Bible. I used to go to church. I used to be in the I'm done with that. And then what if Moses had said enough? Are you willing? Man and woman of God, are you willing to show up to make your way to the mountain of God, waiting patiently, believing God, what he promises in Isaiah, that eye has not seen nor ear has heard what God has pre prepared for those who wait for him. Listen, if he's made a promise, this, wrote this down, God doesn't call you to it without giving you a way to do it. God does not call you to it without giving you a way to do it. So how do we do the Christian life? Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do a thing. Without other Christians, we cannot grow to full capacity. Without God's grace, we cannot stop sinning. And without communion with God, we cannot keep on going. The fifth, and I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna say it because I'm gonna, it's gonna be a part of, it's gonna build on next week's. Next week, we're gonna talk about, I think the fourth is, this is what we know, but I'm gonna give you sort of this one that bridges both weeks. And I'm just gonna tell it to you. I might speak to someone today. I was initially gonna talk a little bit more about it, but I believe it'll fit a little bit more next week too. So here it was, here it is, write it down. Without suffering, we won't learn a thing. Without suffering, the tool, the instrument that God uses to bring us to a place of dependence and reliance on the Holy Spirit is suffering. Without suffering, we won't learn a thing. Suffering shows us where we need to be broken. Suffering makes us sensitive to what God is doing around us and in us. Suffering is the tool that God uses to bring us to a place of awareness and a place of saying, God, I cannot do this anymore. Some of you are suffering tonight. We're gonna to move into a time of prayer right now. That very thing that is causing you pain, the suffering that you're feeling is meant by God to draw you to him.
I believe God hates suffering. I believe there will come a day soon, I hope, where we will no longer see suffering. Heaven is a place with no suffering. Heaven is a place with no pain. But until then, God will use what Satan intends for our harm. God will use for our good. This is the classic story of Joseph. His brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save lives. And so God will use that suffering in your life to impact others. And so we are, as we look about these things that I've talked about tonight, Holy Spirit, Christians, grace, communion, where is it that you need God to help you the most? What area in your life has the Holy Spirit pressed you tonight and says, man, I, that's something that I need help with. Lord, I've, been, I've not been relying on the Spirit or God, I've not seen it, that, that I've been waiting for healing, but you want to give me grace is that, where are you at in this? Maybe for you, you've lacked community. One of the holes that we fill here, we're not here to, I'm not a local church, we're not here to replace the local church, but so many Christians right now don't have local churches. It's a fact. People who claim to be Christians are not connected to a church for a number of reasons. Some because they've been hurt by the church, others because of moving and the transitional aspect of our lives, others because the singles rate is so high in our country and singles just don't, you know, it's hard to be consistently in a church and communing with us. There's so many reasons that we struggle with church. So maybe for you, it's, it's Christian community that you need. Or maybe it's just this, this yearning for communion. Maybe you need solitude and going back to the place of quiet rest. This hymn came to my mind this week. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. And of course, God's invitation to us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you.